it's often questioned why bad things happen, which is his love. And the issue is often discussed and comes up in the mainstream media when uh, natural disasters strike or when something that seems to be unfair happened. And um, was raised in an article within the last few years in the Huffington Post um, in the following way. Two recent events that have dominated the news, the death of Osama bin Laden and the tornadoes that ravaged the southeast, have brought to light one fundamental question humanity has struggled with since the beginning of civilization. Why do we have evil, suffering, pain, illness, and death in the world? A classic question in theology asks, how can a loving yet omnipotent God prevent evil and suffering in the world? The argument goes as follows. A God that allows suffering to continue is either A, not all-powerful, so not omnipotent, and is thus unable to prevent the suffering, B, not loving because this God has the power to prevent suffering, but is unwilling to do so, and or C, not all-knowing, not omniscient, because God only is aware of the suffering after it has already occurred and is too late to prevent it. This problem of evil and God's inability or unwillingness to do anything about it is known in theology as theodicy. So, people might remember it being discussed when the tsunamis hit, or in Asia, or you know, sometimes it comes up with an unexpected loss of a loved one. And so, again, the questions are, can a loving and omnipotent God allow for pain? If so, why would a loving and omnipotent God allow pain to exist? And the question would be simpler if the Bible didn't also say he's omniscient, because if he weren't uh, all knowing, you could point to man's sin in Genesis 3, and then the discussion might be able to end there. God created Eden, who was good, there was no pain, and then man sins, and so it was man's fault, not God's. But that's not the case, so we can't skirt the issue um, because God is on mission. And so the logic that people use when they ask this question is that if a loving God were all powerful, and he does, he, he must use his power to stop pain from occurring in people's lives. So if he's loving and he doesn't stop the pain, he must not have the power. But if he has the power and he doesn't, he must not love us. So, you know, God's word in Ecclesiastes 1 9 tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. And it says, what has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. So, I want to turn to a passage, John 11, where um, these questions, though maybe not put in the same exact form, were actually raised when Christ was there with the people that the events were referring to. So, we're going to read this and then. Uh, talk some more and then circle back to the passage toward, towards the end. But uh, John 11 is a bit of a lengthy passage. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. <coughs> he was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. So his sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not have been death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and her house. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, he said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone him, yet you're going to go back. And Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. So when he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, 
also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go then that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. <clears throat> when Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary, when Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here, she said, and is asking for it. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn him. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <clears throat> when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come along with her, also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Good night. He who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying. Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. <coughs> then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And then shortly after that, they began plotting to kill him. So, like I said, keep this passage marked in mind and we're going we're gonna to circle back to it. This is the main passage that this is the point of the sermon here. But, so there's there are at least three assumptions that are embedded within the statement that a loving and omnipotent God cannot allow a man to experience pain. First, that love is a painless endeavor in the first place. Second, that a loving and omnipotent God's chief concern is that man endures a pain-free existence. And third, that man's highest good is a pain-free existence. So I believe that the Bible shows you that are all incorrect. And so I hope that you can leave the service today assured that God loves you amidst whatever pain you're dealing with. And so the first thing that we should do is define love if we're going to be talking about love as the main issue. Because love can mean many different things. Uh, I googled love's definition. And the first was an intense feeling of deep affection. The second was to feel a deep or romantic sexual attachment to someone. And then, as I was explaining to my son the other day when I was destroying him in Wii Tennis, it also means zero in tennis. And so, which of the terms is correct in, in the biblical context? Well, none of them are exactly correct. We need to look at the Bible to see what the Bible, how the Bible defines love if we're going to be talking about what it means when the Bible says that God is love. Um, it's, the Bible isn't as asserting that God is an intense feeling of deep affection, or that he um, is a feeling, a deep romantic feeling, or that he means zero in tennis. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what it says. And um, we know that it tells us that love is sacrificial, um, which inherently involves some sort of pain or self-denial, not necessarily a physical pain. Um, John 15.3 
15.13 says that greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. So it's love is sacrificial, it's for the good of someone else. And it's of one's own volition. Someone is actually doing it of his own will, not because he's being forced to do it. But while we're not forced to love, we're, we're penalized for our failure to perfectly love. This is one of the purposes of the law, the Ten Commandments. Um, it, the law informs us about what love is because it shows us how we fail to love. And that failure is known as sin, and the wages of sin is death. So if we take a look at um, the Bible's requirements on love, um, Christ summarizes the Ten Commandments as love God and love your neighbor. <coughs> is loving God and the last six is loving your neighbor and really also loving God because you love your neighbor. But this is what the Pharisees failed to see um, when Christ was chastising them in Matthew 23. If you want to turn to Matthew 23, 23. So we 
we see that the, that the law gives us instruction on, on what love is. And uh, there's also a very full description in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to turn there. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So, again, we're going through these things to see, well, if we're, you know, how can love you not think God love or pain, so just reviewing what love is here. And so these, these things here that are explained in 13.4 through 7 are basically um, the elements of the law that Christ fulfilled. He came and he didn't sin because this is what his heart was. This is how he acted. He was loving. He was, um, you know, he was patient. He had disciples who were constantly not getting the point of what he was trying to say. And he was very patient with them. He was, he was kind. He Bible says that he was humble, so he wasn't proud, he wasn't boastful, um, he wasn't self-seeking, certainly, it's a, you know, he came and he died for us, and, you know, he, he will wash away our sins if he, if we come to him, and keep the record of wrongs, he, he rejoices with the truth, he said that he came to testify to the truth when he was before Pontius Pilate, and so, I think this is what the Bible is talking about when it says he didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. He showed us perfectly what love is. He fulfilled the commandments. He didn't sin. He was a personification of these things in 13, 4 through 7. And he, he didn't abolish the requirements. The law is still there to show us you know, what, what we're doing wrong and how we're failing to live up to the standard that God created. It's still showing us that we sin. But he didn't cancel its effects. Um, like it says in Colossians 2, um, the written code that he canceled is not the law itself, but our condemnation is a result of our failure to follow the law. And this is what he made a public spectacle of at the cross. So, we see that love is not a painless endeavor. I don't think that you can separate love um, from pain, really. Um, and we can all attest to this in our lives that they're probably the people who we love the most are the ones who we've made the most <coughs> sacrifices for, that we've endured the most pain for. And um, I think if we turn back to John 11, and that's why Jesus required himself and some of his friends to suffer for a time so that they would know a higher love and they would see a higher good in their lives, which is abiding in him. John, back to John 11. I'm not going to read through this whole thing again, but um, if you look at verse 4, uh, Jesus said it's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. This um, occurrence with Lazarus. And then if you skip ahead to verse 21. Martha comes out, and the first thing that she says to Jesus is, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Basically, don't you love us? Why didn't you come? Why didn't you come and save my brother from dying? And then, um, in verse 32, Mary says the same thing, Lord. You know, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Don't you love us? Why didn't you come and save my brother from, from dying? Because you wouldn't have let this happen if you loved us. Basically what she's saying. But we know that he loved them because it says in verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So and he loved everyone who was involved in this passage. Even though they all had a painful experience here. And then, um, you know, Jesus saw her weeping and he wept as well. So it wasn't only painful for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but also for Jesus. And... Of course, when he starts weeping, the people say, look, he loved him because he was weeping. They saw the pain that he was in. And 
See how they, see how he loved them. But then, what is the response right after that? Well, the same thing that we're talking about here. Well, um, could not he have opened the eyes of the blind and kept this man from dying? So these people are saying, no, I, he, I don't think he really did love him because he was powerful. If he can open the eyes of the blind, he must be able to keep this man from dying. And so he must not have loved him if he didn't do that. And so then verse 38 talks again about how Jesus was deeply moved. And then we get again to the more of the purpose of what was going on in verse 42. Jesus says, I knew that you always hear me. He's praying. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. So, and then Jesus shows that he has power over death. And so we see um, in this passage that Christ intentionally delayed going to help Lazarus. That's what it says in verse 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. So, you know, a doctor would probably be sued for malpractice these days if he heard that someone was sick and they wanted to come and, you know, perform the surgery and, and, uh, and he just sits on his hands for a couple of days before wanting to do something about it. But um, this says that Jesus intentionally delayed and he did so that people wouldn't believe that he was the Son of God, which is a better, a higher purpose. So... <coughs> We see that the highest purpose isn't always man living in pain for existence in this passage. And he came, and then, and then Christ came and he did something that was uh, sacrificial and of his own will, a volitional act in Acts 22. Uh, Acts 2, 22 to 23, it tells us that Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to Israel by the miracles, signs, and wonders he performed amongst them. It is part of God's own plan, he himself. He, God's own son, was handed over to be put to death by being held to the cross. There's something that he came and suffered this great pain on, on our behalf um, of his own will to show us the depths of his love for us. He chose to die for us to atone for our sins and to conquer death for us. A very painful experience for him, showing us the, the depth of his love, which I don't think could have been portrayed absent the type of pain that he went through. So then, why, why does God still allow the world to experience pain? I think it's ultimately for our own good. And there are a couple of types um, of pain. There's a type of pain that comes from discipline, like with our children. And then there is a pain that is there from a sinful world. And the pain of discipline is talked about um, in Hosea 5, right after... The other verse, that we, the other chapter that we were reading in Hosea, talking about the manner in which they had violated the law. And in Hosea 5, 14, after he goes through and is talking about all the judgment that is going to rain down on Israel, he says, I'll be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I'll tear them to pieces and go away. I'll carry them off with no one to rescue them. Then I'll return to my letter until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery they will earnestly seek me. And so we see God disciplining Israel here um, to get Israel to turn back to him. And in Hebrews 12, we have the same thing where God talks about disciplining his children so that they can become more like him. And then we have another kind of pain which I think is a larger part of the discussion when people are asking the question about why we have pain, which is more of a general pain that we have in our fallen world. And um, so if you turn to Job 20, Job 21, <coughs> I think that this passage, passage shows that without some of this more general pain, there are many people who would have never turned to God. And so, I think that God uses this more general form of pain, this common pain that happens to everybody in the world, in part to show Himself to people, which is their own, in their own best good, better for them than living in pain for existence. So, verse chapter 21, Then Job replied, 
Listen carefully to my words. Let this be the consolation you give me. Bear with me while I speak, and after I've spoken, rock on. Because they, the people who are saying before this are basically, you know, bad things are just happening to you because you're a bad person. Is my complaint directed to a human being? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be appealed. Clap your hand over your mouth. When I think about this, I'm terrified. Trembling seizes my body. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. Their bulls never fail to breed, and their cows calve and do not miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. Their little ones dance about. They sing to the music of timbrel and lyre. They make merry to the sound of the pipe. They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, Leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? But their prosperity is not in their own hands, so I stand aloof from the plan of the wicked. We see here that sometimes in this passage, Job is kind of talking about the opposite thing. What happens when there are why do you, why don't bad things happen to bad people? Because this is a case where there were bad people and it says wicked people who just lived a wonderful life. Nothing bad ever happened to them. But then they got to the end of their life and the worst possible thing happened to them, which is that they had rejected God because they thought that they had no need for Him. And so I think that sometimes um, painful experiences can save people like this from 